A primary for the books this week, some steamrollers, some squeakers, some outright winners, and some headed to November. And one of the biggest races in the biggest county became an early and decisive win. As Miami-Dade Mayor Daniela Levine Cava blew out six challengers, she got 58% of the vote, more than all six other candidates combined. This is a nonpartisan race that did have overt partisan overtones in an election cycle that now includes the first partisan races for sheriff, election supervisor, tax collector, property appraiser, and clerk of courts. Five departments going independent from the county next year. State voters decided to do that to make that change in 2018. Big challenges and big change ahead. And we begin right there with Miami-Dade Mayor Daniela Levine Cava headed for a second term and right here with us today for her first sit down interview since winning re-election. And thank you for that. Although we've had some stand up interviews <laughs> since winning re-election. Yes. Welcome. Thank you Welcome. so much, Glenn. Always and congratulations. a congratulations. Thank you. So I, I want to start right there because that was, I mean, you called it decisive and it was. It was kind of a blowout with six challengers uh, a nonpartisan race, but most of whom were Republicans and, and voters who were engaged knew that. And in the campaign, the biggest criticism that they were lobbing your way was of county spending. And then you won very decisively. What, what is that message? What's the takeaway for you with that? People know who I am. They see how much I care. They know I'm listening to them. and providing programming that meets their needs. And I think people validated that with their vote. So uh, aside from care and working, the, the money part, the spending part, do you take that as a message that people are okay with spending, okay with maybe um, spending a, a bit more, a bit, uh, couple more cents on the dollar for the programs, for extra? Is, do you hear it that way? First of all, it was a very simplistic criticism. It didn't really take into account where is this money coming from. A great deal of it came from federal and state sources, a huge increase in infrastructure spending, overdue maintenance, repairs, and a lot of money from the federal government to help us recover our economy. So a lot of it really isn't a tax burden per se. So I think that people understood that we, two years in a row, did a tax rate cut the lowest rate since 1980, and uh, the first time in over a decade that there was a cut. So people saw that we were working hard to help them and that the dollars that we were using were for things like affordability, helping to provide housing for people who were not able to afford to stay here, or uh, the, again, maintenance and repair issues. So I think people were validating our priorities and recognizing that we were doing our best to bring down the necessary funds to help. And I want to get a bit deeper into the money and the spending, the budget. I, I just want to ask you about a little bit of the news of the week on, on Friday, I think it was. Uh, we saw the letter from a county veteran, Alex yes. Munoz, who resigned. Uh, he, I know he had been the head of animal services and a few other things. He was the head of internal services, in essence, overseeing real estate acquisition. Uh, submitted his resignation, I think a public surprise, I think it really was. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was a surprise to you. Um, but in the midst of a bit of a controversy, a public controversy about overpaying for the county, overpaying for certain parcels mm -hmm. of real estate where government is going. So I don't know if that's coincidence. That's what sort of my question is. Did you ask for his resignation? Was that a coincidence? Outline. So Alex is, as you say, a veteran, has served very capably for many years, and he's decided to move on. Okay, so no inside behind the scenes story on that this morning? Yes. Okay. All right, well then let's get back to um, the elections. And I wanna ask you kind of, generally speaking, you've been four years uh, as mayor, you have been a commissioner before that, not new to county government, certainly not new even before mm -hmm. that. I think we met when you were on the plaza of county government <laughs> uh, before one of the meetings way back when, trying with a bullhorn, trying to organize people and teach them how to advocate for themselves. Yes, um, yes. That said, as you head into a second term, are there lessons learned? What are you bringing with you? And uh, you know, share maybe something you might do differently because of a lesson learned. Well, I am uh, very, very uh, open always to learning. Uh, I'm trying to create a learning culture inside county government. 
Uh, we don't want to be status quo. We want to operate at the speed of business. We want to be responsive to the public. And just as you said, I was on the outside pressing government to do the right thing. And I came inside to make sure that people would be heard. So that is a lesson learned for me, is that we need to do even more to make sure that the public is heard uh, when it comes to our priorities and, and our programming. Uh, practically speaking, how is that going to happen? We're in the middle of budget season once again. We're doing a full round of uh, public budget workshops. Uh, we have some special ones for women's issues, for business issues. So we're very, very responsive. We want uh, people to, to be part of this and to see that government is working for them. And I do think that I have changed perception for many that government is accountable, that government is open, and I need to do even more. You know, the um, nonpartisan nature of your job, you sit with 13 commissioners, nonpartisan government. Lately, as everything else has become in our world, things have been very divided and partisan, and, and that's mm -hmm. how the race kind of played out for the primary, even though this was a nonpartisan race again. Um, the five constitutional offices that we outlined coming up, sheriff especially, um, is a partisan race. It, it, by constitutional design, there is a Democrat that you are backing and a Republican going into that race. How do you foresee that playing out? Who, whoever wins, mm -hmm. you will have to have a relationship with as mayor. No, you're the sheriff right now. Yes. No longer as his or her boss. Yes, yes. Oh, why? Well, what, do you, first, what do you foresee? It yes, that? first I just want to be clear. I won with bipartisan support did. and independence, did. and that I think is my secret sauce, that I am perceived to be about getting things done, and that even though I have a political affiliation, that's not what drives my everyday handling of the affairs of Miami-Dade County. And I also think that the commission itself works well mm -hmm. in that regard. So you don't see alliances so much along party lines there. So now that we have these partisan roles, and you mentioned specifically the sheriff, which I think is a shame, I think it works very well for local government to be nonpartisan. I'll work with who's ever elected. And that is how I work now. I work very well across the aisle with our state legislative delegation, with our federal legislative delegation, and no matter who is serving, of course, we have to have a strong working relationship. So this week we spoke to both the Democrat candidate, which you are backing, James Reyes, the Republican candidate going mm -hmm. to November, Rosie Cordero Stutz. The two of them independently said much the same thing, that they're going into this role not as their party affiliation, but to be a law enforcer for all. And yes. yet, they will have to face you and the commission asking for their budget. Um, in a time when you have ev either opposed them or supported them. Do you see that as an issue coming up? You know, we take a long-term view in politics, allies today, adversaries tomorrow, <laughs> and that's how it is party uh, regardless. So I, I would like to, I know we're coming up against a break. What I'd like to do is take that quick break and get into some detail about spending. What, what are we spending on? Why are we spending on it? What are we cutting? And we will do that when we come right back. We are back with Miami-Dade Mayor Daniela Levine-Cava, re-elected for a second term on Tuesday night in a resounding victory. Um, we are going to talk money and uh, budget. And yes. the prevailing headline on every budget is it reflects values, it <laughs> reflects priorities. Yes. Budgets almost $13 billion, um, probably the highest, I think, in county history. Yes. Without federal era money, COVID money. Um, so what... What is the priority yes. here? Well, to be clear, we are still spending on our Recovery Act money and our infrastructure bill money. So it does include substantial federal dollars, especially for infrastructure. Still. Uh, still. So that is a really big portion. Also, as we build more, we collect more fees and we put that into our building department, uh, our water and sewer, as we collect more <laughs> fees, we put it. So is that your way of saying, <laughs> okay, everyone, take a deep breath? Well, I, it is. But that's a lot of money. No, and, and I do explain to people the airport is growing 10% year over year and it's a proprietary fund, all the money stays there. So naturally they have to spend more to be able to maintain the airport. So important to note that property tax although it funds government, is not the overall, I think it's a third of government. Yes, general fund money. money right. All right, so let's get into the priorities here. Um, I'd like to put up a, the big dollar bill that I stole out of the county budget packet. Um, hard to see, but what this does is break down every dollar of government spending into how many cents. 
this year, and I know you can't read it very closely on TV, but, uh, but uh, for the general discussion, there is a new pot of money here for the constitutional offices, the five that we talked about, and the pots of money that are a bit less this year to make up that money, the biggest hit is to public safety. Um, public safety is going to be this independent sheriff's office now. I explain how that will work, why that's less, will there be something to make up that money, and, mm -hmm. uh, and public safety is a priority. Yeah, whenever you create a new office, there are increased administrative costs. So we have had to, uh, actually by statute, we have to rebrand the sheriff's office, new striping on police cars, all of that costs quite a bit of money, uh, many millions, and then you have um, whatever the new sheriff will decide that he or she wants to do to enhance their programming. Because the budget is still from the county. It all comes out of the same pot of money. That's exactly right. So does the, it, it was 30 cents on the dollar last year. Now it's uh, 19 cents on the dollar. So minus 11 cents on the dollar. What makes up that budget? It, is it made up? Yeah, so public safety wasn't just police. It was other ancillary functions, corrections. Um, fire is part, yeah. part of that? Fire also has its own dedicated right. uh, millage. Yeah. So we are putting money into the maintenance of the police department, plus the changes that are mandated, plus creating a reserve for what may come up. And we do expect that who's ever elected is going to come knocking at the county commission and say, this is what we need. Oh, okay, so I'm just to, I'm not very clear. So all of that money that you need to come up with, yet in this budget, it's less than it was last year. No, because some of it is still in the public safety pot. So exactly to get into the weeds on it, we would have to go to the budget book, but I can assure you that there are no cuts to public safety okay. in this budget. Well, maybe one, one of these hours you'll come back and we'll take that deep dive into the budget <laughs> book because I know yes. it's this big. All right, okay, so the, um, the other thing I know that is very important, you have, uh, the county has affordable housing programs um, probably that are going to need to expand because of what's occurring in the county. You lay out the, the top three priorities in your second term. Yes, I have declared a, a crisis of affordability. We did that in 2022. I was going to say, that was a couple of years ago. Yes, and yes, still. and we've been doubling down. We've doubled the amount of money in the recurring budget of the county. We've also drawn down a lot of federal money, um, and, and we have to continue. So we came out with a plan a couple of years ago called the Homes Plan with a, a set of, of innovative programming, and now we're going to come up with some new ones in the near future. But something that not everybody knows about is the condominiums that require the um, special assessments for vital repairs that everybody is aware of, of course, because of the Champlain Towers and that, uh, and collapse. And that's already becoming sort of a slow motion catastrophe for a lot of yes. people who live in yes. condos for a So long. we know that even Champlain Towers was affected by inadequate reserves. So what we've yeah. done, we created a fund that pays up to $50,000 for 40 years, zero interest for people earning up to 140% of area median income. So it's a middle class program as well, and many hundreds of people have already benefited from that program. And we really want to encourage people to take advantage of that. We don't want to see them losing their homes. We want them to stay, and we want to make sure these buildings are safe. Um, I'm going to talk transportation a little bit because also on that ballot was this straw poll. We yes. had Chair Oliver Gilbert, the chair of the commission, in here some weeks ago. Uh, he, he was sort of spearheading that along yes. with some uh, Commissioner Eileen Higgins. There was a big yes from the county on this straw poll, which, which asked about rail mostly, rail going into the future, which was very interesting because, you know, rail has now taken a back seat to rapid transit bus. And how do, you, how do you see that straw poll? Where will you go, if anywhere, where will you go with that? I think it is a validation that people recognize that transit is the solution to traffic, which is what I always say. There's only so much you could do building roads and, and to get cars off the road, you have to have good transit. So I think that's basically the message, exactly how that will lead to funding, will be determined, but we are that's making a, that's progress. A big TBD. It's a big TBD. <laughs> but the point is, I think the public is ready to have that conversation. We 
know that people have been very disappointed because the half penny was programmed as a full penny, people thought, and they didn't get the full penny's worth. So people have been very disappointed and their trust was diminished. I think this vote indicates, and be, by the way, people are voting with their feet because our transit ridership is up above pre-pandemic levels, which is unique in but the bus country. Bus or rail or both? Both, both. You, you know, metro rail expansion is phenomenally expensive. Mm -hmm. Also takes a very, very long time. So yes, we all want to have a one seat ride, um, but if you have good, um, Places where you can switch out, like we've enhanced the Dadeland station to accommodate the bus rapid transit. And, you know, I did vote for an extension of rail, but it would have been a little less likely to get federal funding. We got the federal funding for the bus rapid transit, also for the Northeast Corridor. We're in the president's budget. We're in the state budget. We're programmed to do that corridor. Also, we're completing studies on the North Corridor up to Hard Rock with support from our Congresswoman, Frederica Wilson. Our express bus on 836 that goes to the Dolphin Park and Ride and west of FIU has been so popular that we've had to add service. So people are getting on the bus. All right, well, um, <laughs> that sort of ties into my last question. Is uh, in the state of the county address, you talked about this $2.5 billion GO bond, uh, general obligation bond you'd like to float. Um, the last one was 20 years ago, is it 20? About yes, 20 years which is ago? coming uh, gradually to the end. Yeah, we're still, we're paying, still paying for it, but it's coming to an end. So our calculation, and we did ask the public uh, to weigh in before we went forward with that. We think it would have passed because it would not have added any s significant amount, very but, minuscule. But you, it, you postponed it. Well, because there were many, especially on the commission, who said we have to include transit. Now, including transit costs more. So that will have to be determined whether we can move forward. And I do think that this straw poll is part of that conversation. So are you bringing back the bond? We will be exactly looking at what would be the appetite to bring back a bond and for what purpose and at what amount. All right, well, we'll uh, stay tuned. <laughs> Mayor, thanks so much for being here. Always. I appreciate it and congrats again on your second term. I'm very excited to continue to serve. Thank you. All right, and you'll be back. Absolutely.